Now we move on to item four. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please call item four? Yes, item 4A is a study session on the city's gas monitoring system for the former land use site. Landfill site? Um, landfill site, thank you. Thank you. Hold on just a moment, Shannon. And we'll have our staff report first. And let me just say, um, since we've been doing this, um, taking comments before we ask questions, um, I'm going to announce now that we're opening up the lines. And uh, I'll read the number again, except that I put it in the back so that it wouldn't be in front of me. Uh, and the number is 310-312-8173. Oh, sorry. There we go. Yeah, look how low I am. I know you want your functions. Oh, I'm just trying to do this stuff. Maybe my pads are Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, and City Manager. My name is Shannon Perry, and I'm the City's Chief Sustainability Officer, and I manage the Office of Sustainability and the Environment. You are used to having me up here talk to you, talking to you about cutting-edge, innovative sustainability programs. Tonight, I'm here to present a slightly different topic. Tonight, we're talking about the city's landfill gas control system. Due to the impacts of COVID on staff and workloads, this project recently came to my office. As we were taking over the contract and starting to get a sense of the scope of work out at the city yards, and coming up to speed on the landfill gas system um, itself, we thought it was important to bring this issue to you, the city council, and also to the members of our public so that everybody had access to the most accurate, up-to-date information so that you could really be aware of, of this issue. Um, so here we are tonight. We are gonna give you um, a detailed and hopefully not too technical um, deep dive into um, this, this topic. Um, I know that I know that some people felt like well, there was a lot of technical information in our staff report, and I appreciate you bearing with us on this. I think it's really important when we're talking about something like this that we get into the details. And so you will find a lot of content in our presentation tonight, uh, but we will we have built into um, our strategy a lot of time for you to ask questions um, at the end. So here's where we are tonight. Um, I'm going to introduce to you the city team that's working on this project. And then I'm going to introduce our independent third-party contractor who will give the bulk of the presentation because she is the subject area expert and because she is an independent third-party who really is, um, does the operations and maintenance of the system itself. And then we'll circle back for questions and comments. Um, when we get to questions and comments, uh, your t entire city team will be available to you. So the folks who are really working on this team, like I mentioned, the contract management and coordination of this work came to the Office of Sustainability and the Environment. Um, we also have Rick Fulte, our Acting Director of Public Works, Peter James, this is our Public Works Chief Operations Officer, Chris Dishlip, who is our Capital Program Manager, and then James Bellis conway um, on my team. Um, it really coordinates the contract itself. He is out on parental leave right now. Um, and then, Complementing our city team, we have um, Montrose Environmental. Um, if you remember, you've recently approved their contract um, for a, another period of time to serve as the um, operations, the contractor for operations of the landfill site. So Margaret Patrick is with Montrose, like I said, independent, third party, really t brings her technical expertise to not only monitor the site, but also to help city staff understand the best practices um, for not only the management of our land site, landfill, but how other cities who have historical landfills are addressing them in urban areas. So with that, I will hand this portion of the presentation over to Margaret, and then I will come back at the end. Thank you. Hey, I'm going to take that off so you can hear me a little better. Um, so good evening, uh, Mayor, City Council, and also the public. Uh, my name is Margaret Patrick, and tonight we're going to be discussing 
the uh, landfill that's maintained by the city of Santa Monica. Um, just to give you a quick background on me, I've been working and living in Southern California for the past 25 years on a lot of sites very similar to this site. Um, my company that I work for is a full service uh, consulting company. We do all types of different environmental projects, but a lot of the work that I do is specifically related to landfills and uh, solid waste transfer stations. <clears throat> Oops, sorry. <laughs> Can I move this closer here? Here we go. Okay, so I have to lean over between every slide. Okay, so the purpose of this study session is to help you all understand the landfill a little bit better. Um, sorry, I keep jumping around. So we're going to start with the uh, site history, then we're going to talk a little bit about what is landfill gas, um, then explain the system components of the system that you have at that site and also the current regulatory requirements, um, the current environmental compliance, and lastly, the current maintenance and future upgrades. So the site history um, began actually back in 1928. Um, the area was a clay mining pit. Um, the red outline on these figures is actually the city's yard. It is not the extent of the landfill or necessarily the extent of the clay pits. Um, the site, um, the, the reason the clay pits were later converted into a landfill is because that was a common practice at the time. Um, the idea is that clay has low permeability, um, putting waste in it is less likely to contaminate groundwater. Um, the last waste was placed in the landfill in 1970, and it's estimated that approximately 300,000 cubic yards of waste was landfilled. Um, to put that into perspective, one cubic yard of waste is actually the um, size of an average washing machine. So, <clears throat> um, There are a lot of local landfills in Southern California. A lot of people don't even realize how many local landfills there are in Southern California. And many of them are older, small neighborhood landfills similar to Santa Monica um, that were put in place um, back again in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, before we had the current um, environmental regulations that we do today. Um, and then for comparison to some of the local landfills, um, again, talking about the volume of the Santa Monica landfill, it's only 300,000 cubic yards. Um, the Puente Hills landfill, which uh, closed um, a few years ago, is approximately 53 million cubic yards of solid waste. And there's another active landfill that's still in uh, Orange County in Brea, um, and it has uh, it will eventually have a maximum capacity of 148 million cubic yards of waste. And one of the things I want to point out is these landfills also, just like the Santa Monica landfill, are located near residential areas, and you can see there are homes that come right up to the perimeter of some of these facilities. And of course, in Southern California, the big problem is real estate is in shortage, so. We end up having homes right next to landfills. <clears throat> so one thing that is good about your landfill is it is an older landfill. And so the types of waste that were accepted in this landfill um, are different than what we would see in a modern landfill. And in my opinion, somewhat better. Um, so basically in the 1950s, a lot of waste was still burned. People could still uh, burn their landscape and their leaves in their backyards. Um, we didn't have you know, the air quality um, laws that we have now. Um, and then there was actually a time when there was incineration being done at the landfill. Um, and then there was also a lot of inert um, construction debris put in this site. So wood, metal, concrete, bricks. Um, and then there is some municipal, sorry, mixed municipal solid waste. Sometimes we call it MSW. Um, and that's your, your typical household residential trash, such as your food waste, um, paper, tin, glass bottles, rubber, landscape debris. <clears throat> Uh, and just to point out, so, you know, people will see pictures of an incinerator and they're like, oh, an incinerator. But what that means for um, current residents now is that all of that waste, um, when it's incinerated, is no longer containing is the organic materials that then can produce landfill gas later on. So the more of it that's incinerated, the less landfill gas is being produced. Um, another example of that, there is a landfill on Pebbly Beach Landfill that I work on. Um, they incinerated their waste up until 2002. So um, that site does not even have a landfill gas control system um, because they have so little um, landfill gas being put off. They're an unusual situation. <laughs> so post-landfill, <clears throat> um, the site was capped with three to five feet of cover soil 
which was in, in, accord in accordance with the environmental regulations at the time. Um, the city of Santa Monica was actually already using the yard and, and adding buildings in the northwest area, so you can kind of see some of the city buildings on this figure. Again, the red outline is the outline of the city um, property. And then the east side of the site was being used as a baseball field. And then um, it was originally called Stewart Street Park and later renamed to Gandhara Park, um, and which still exists today. And I was actually over there at the park earlier today, and it's really a lovely park. There's kids playing. I saw a father helping his son, you know, th learn to throw a baseball, um, and it's a really nice area. And there were some residents walking around and laying around sunning, reading books. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so typical use of landfills. Um, post landfill phase is is parks and golf courses. That's two of the main things that they get converted into. <clears throat> so in the 1970s to the 1990s, um, really starting more in the 1990s, um, new regulations for landfills became enacted. So at the time that this landfill closed, there were no regulations in place or very limited regulations in place compared to what an active landfill these days um, has. However, that doesn't mean to say that we are not following current regulations on this site. Um, <clears throat> but in 1976, we, came, um, we had the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, or RICRA, that was created, and it was passed to ensure that wastes were managed in an environmentally sound manner. Um, during the 1980s, there were incidents where old landfills with uncontrolled landfill gas caused unexpected fires or explosions. So that drew um, a lot of public attention to landfills and the dangers of the methane gas in the landfill gas. Um, and then also at one point, um, it was believed that a closed landfill would stop um, producing landfill gas after about 30 years. Um, that was found to be later incorrect because um, <clears throat> depending on the type of waste that's disposed, um, we are finding that some landfills can keep emitting gas for a very long time, unfortunately. Um, so finally, in the 1990s, there were new regulations enacted for landfill gas control. And Santa Monica, the city of Santa Monica, began monitoring the landfill gas. In 1996, they installed um, perimeter monitoring probes. Uh, later on, they installed an interim landfill gas control system. That was started in March of 1998. And then a permanent system that incorporated that system was constructed and began operation fully online in 2001. So since 2001, that system has been monitored and operated by third-party consultants. Um, it was um, overseen by ICF International through 2016. And then my company, Montrose Environmental Solutions, was awarded the contract um, originally in 2016. And it was renewed, and we now have another five years um, of course, unless we mess up and you fire us. <laughs> so, okay. <clears throat> so what is landfill gas? So now we're going to get into the technical stuff. Um, so hopefully you all had your coffee this evening. Um, <laughs> the composition of landfill gas depends on the age of the landfill and the types of waste it contains. So landfill gas is typically made up of approximately 40 to 50% carbon dioxide and then 50% less of methane um, with nitrogen, which is the, the main gas in air, making up most of the balance. There's also small amounts of other volatile organic compounds and sulfur compounds such as hydrogen sulfide. <clears throat> so this is a generic graph of a landfill over time. And so um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because it is a little bit complicated to look at, but the bright hot pink line is your methane. Um, and you can see that when waste is first placed, which is the Roman numeral one, um, there is no methane. And then as the um, little microbes in the waste um, get to work, um, they start digesting that waste and producing methane gas. And so over time, that methane will go up and you can see it kind of peaks in the center of the graph and then it starts to go back down. Um, <clears throat> the reason there are no actual years um, for the time scale is because it varies for every landfill. So larger landfills may have much longer time scale than smaller landfills. Um, but we're estimating based on the amount of methane that my company monitors regularly at the site that you are around this uh, phase in here where I've got the red arrow and the little circle. So basically your landfill um, gas methane content is down to about 20% or less um, in all of your in landfill gas extraction wells. So that's why we're, we're at the end phase here. <clears throat> um, eventually that will mean that if, if the landfill, if the methane drops enough, that we will be able to turn off the system. 
but that is unlikely to occur right away, and we will continue monitoring. And before a system is turned off, we have to go through a very um, detailed health risk assessment um, and obviously, you know, obtain permits and make sure that everything is, is done regulatorily uh, before we turn off any system. So. <laughs> So in the meantime, we're going to keep operating that system. Um, <clears throat> so methane is, um, it occurs both in nature and it's also produced by human activities. So there's many sources of methane. Um, animal burps and farts are actually the number one source of methane um, in the country, um, especially the cattle industry. Um, the methane is produced both from their, their stomachs <laughs> and also from their manure. Um, termites also produce methane as part of their digestion processes. And of course, we have natural gas that's found in the ground um, frequently in conjunction with oil. Um, and that natural gas we use in transportation, in gas heating in our homes, in gas appliances, gas fireplaces, etc. cetera. Um, another large source of methane is, of course, anaerobic bacterial decomposition of organics. So that's a mouthful there. Um, and that's vegetation, plant, food, any carbon-based source will break down and um, little microbes will basically convert it into methane. So not only do landfills have methane, but your compost piles in your backyard will give off a little bit of methane. Um, wetlands will, will give off a little bit of methane. Um, and then also um, recent problems with climate change is we have uh, permafrost um, that's thawing and that area is very boggy and peaty and that also is giving off methane, <clears throat> which unfortunately is making things worse, <laughs> accelerating the, the process. Um, <clears throat> so methane is generally stable. Um, it is not poisonous. Um, a lot of people are concerned um, about the health risk of it. The main health risk is that at concentrations between 5 and 15 percent in air, in the presence of oxygen, it is flammable and can ignite. Um, so we have what's called the lower flammable limit. So less than 5 percent methane will not ignite. I could hold a match to it and it will not ignite or over 15%, it's considered too rich um, and also will not ignite. Um, so uh, the site is required to keep the methane in the perimeter monitoring probes below 5%. Um, that is the, the California Code of Regulations limit. Um, the reason we do that is because that helps ensure that any methane that might migrate up through the soil to the air will end up being less than 5%. Um, what I want to point out is that there are some landfill gas extractions um, wells at the site that do have methane in that flammable range. However, even if I were to hold a match up to one of these, which I will not do, but um, <clears throat> it's likely unlikely to produce a sustained flame because it does not have enough oxygen. It's basically sucking um, air out of the ground, and so it doesn't have enough oxygen, so the flame will just snuff out. <clears throat> that makes sense? Maybe. <laughs> Everyone's still awake? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so one of the, the components of uh, landfill gas um, that is more of a concern are volatile organic compounds. Um, the concentration of volatile organic compounds will vary depending on, again, the waste that was disposed of in the landfill, but it, they usually comprise a very small amount, so uh, less than 0.1% of the gas will, have, uh, will be VOCs. And one of the nice things about this landfill is that older municipal solid waste landfills usually have much lower VOCs than modern landfills because they received a lot less plastic waste and chemicals. So the majority of the household trash that was disposed of in the Santa Monica landfill was in the 1950s and 60s. 60s. So during that period, um, we were still using aluminum cans and glass bottles, um, not plastic for sodas. Um, styrofoam was increasing in use at fast food restaurants, but paper was also very heavily used. Um, there was a lot less plastic packaging overall. Your laundry and dish, de dish detergent came in cardboard boxes instead of plastic containers. Um, there were less synthetic fabrics that people were wearing. So all your clothes, we have so many clothes now that are made up out of petroleum products. Um, back then, we did not have that. It was more cotton and things that are, you know, more biodegradable. <clears throat> and lastly, uh, the flame retardant chemicals, which we're, you know, hearing so much about, um, were not in common use yet either. So the waste that was disposed of in this landfill had a lot less um, overall uh, chemical makeup than, uh, than the current landfills. <clears throat> So this is a map, um, hopefully you can see it, it's a little bit small, unfortunately, of the landfill gas control system components. Um, the little red um, things are the landfill gas wells, and then the pink and the blue are probe locations. I'm going to get into some more detailed maps here later on so you can see a little bit more. 
Um, one thing I wanted to point out, though, is you can see the park. Um, you can see also this, the city area and the city buildings. So what is a landfill gas extraction well? Basically, the site has 10 vertical landfill gas extraction wells. Um, these are drilled um, down to depths of approximately 40 feet deep, which is the, waste, uh, the depth of the waste. Um, and they are under a constant vacuum of 50, oh, it got cut off. 15, 15 to 20 inches, I believe, is what it should say on the slide. Um, and over on the left, you can see a diagram of what a typical landfill gas extraction well is. So it's basically a tube in the ground um, with some perforations at the bottom, and we um, put put it under vacuum, and that it helps suck uh, landfill gas out of the ground. And it usually has what we call a certain radi of, radius of influence um, around that well, where it's extracting and pulling landfill gas towards it. And that landfill gas then gets moved or taken over to the treatment system. Oh, I don't know why these slides got messed up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so the landfill gas extraction wells are all connected to an 8-inch diameter collection pipe known as a header. And it's constructed of high-density polyethylene. And that takes the landfill gas over to the treatment compound. Um, but through the use of a 20 horsepower blower. So this blower is constantly sucking on these wells and pulling the gas over to the treatment compound. And I think um, under here that, <laughs> I believe it said that the, uh, the overall system vacuum is, is um, 30 to 40 inches of vacuum. <clears throat> Um, and then just to explain a little bit more about those extraction wells under vacuum, it's very similar to your, you know, vacuum you would use at your house. Um, the little base area is what we, you know, we're pretending is the blower and it's uh, pulling the gas, which is, you know, the, the air that's coming through that pipe. Um, so, for instance, if you were to have a crack in the hose of your vacuum, that would not actually leak air, it would suck air in. So um, the reason I'm explaining it this way is that basically the system, um, if it were to have a crack in one of the pipes or one of those landfill gas extraction wells, they would actually be drawing air into the system. Um, it would not be releasing gas um, out to the atmosphere. Um, and we do come out, um, my company comes out and checks those uh, wells in the treatment system biweekly. Um, and we can tell right away because we take readings at the um, control system if there is um, a, a landfill gas leak because we're going to see an increase in oxygen concentration. So we'll know that we need to go out and check the field and look thoroughly for, for that and make, make sure we correct that. <clears throat> um, so another part of the uh, landfill gas treatment system is the treatment um, vessels, and they consist of two large vessels that contain granular activated carbon and potassium permanganate alumina granules. Basically, these are very similar to what you would have at a water treatment system at your house or even an air filter at your house. A lot of air filters use carbon. Um, so the landfill gas is pushed through that, and that helps remove and oxidize those volatile organic compounds. And then the outlet of the treatment system is discharged to a pipe that's up, um, going up into the air. Um, another part of the system is the landfill gas detection probes. Um, so these are subsurface monitoring probes. There's a total of 37 of them, and they're used to detect landfill gas around the perimeter of the site um, and also in trenches. Um, these probes um, each have, uh, or most of these probes have three different depths. So this is just a diagram showing you what they look like underground. Um, so the shallow probes are from seven to nine feet below ground. The intermediate ones are 18 to 21, and the deep ones are 33 to 35 feet below the ground surface. And so when we go to monitor your site, um, we go out there, we connect a piece of equipment to these probes um, with a little bit of vacuum on it. It basically pulls gas from the probes, and we're able to collect a measurement to see what the, the methane reading is in the probe at that particular time. Um, so these probes, um, so eight of these probes are located along the perimeter with the uh, mobile home park, and there are also eight landfill gas wells located along that perimeter, and then two sumps. So these are all used to detect and prevent landfill gas migration into that residential area. <clears throat> so the regulatory requirements for the site. Um, so this site is in compliance with the South Coast Air Quality Management District um, rules and Title 27 of the California Code of Regulations, um, which is overseen by the uh, County of Los Angeles Department of Public Health, which is your local enforcement agency. 
Um, so quarterly, we, we prepare reports with the data, the monitoring data that we've collected, and we send those out to those two agencies. Um, and then we are performing monitoring in accordance with a site-specific um, AQMD permit to operate and an AQMD Rule 1150.1 compliance plan. <clears throat> In addition to that, your LEA will come out to the site quarterly and also do his own monitoring, uh, his or her own monitoring, um, and do uh, probe checks and, and some other things too. So, so in addition to our monitoring, you also have an outside regulator coming out to the site and checking it. <clears throat> so this is just a little overview of what we do at the site. Bi-weekly, we come out, we check the landfill gas control system, make sure everything's operating properly. Um, we check the uh, treatment vessels to make sure that the, the landfill gas that's um, going through the treatment is has all the VOCs removed as it should be. Um, if it, we see that it starts to exceed 20 parts per million, um, then we will schedule a media replacement, make sure that the carbon and uh, the other granules are changed out so it keeps working the way it's supposed to. Uh, quarterly, we monitor the landfill gas and the vacuum in all the extraction wells, which we also will make adjustments to if necessary. We monitor the methane and pressure in all the probes, 37 probes, each one of them, three different depths, so a total of almost 80 um, plus probes. Um, we also conduct instantaneous surface monitoring for methane throughout the park. So that's done by holding a monitoring device about three inches above the ground, walking through the park, um, checking for, for methane. <clears throat> and then we also will collect at the same time a sample of air, um, and that is submitted to a laboratory. Um, a certified laboratory to uh, have it analyzed. And then we also do uh, monitoring on the indoor buildings throughout the city of Santa, Santa Monica Corporation Yard to make sure that there's no methane in them. A <clears throat> um, few more things with the monitoring. Quarterly, we also conduct, um, <clears throat> oh, I think that's a repeat actually. Um, yeah, that is a repeat. And then annually, we collect a, a landfill gas system outlet and inlet sample and have a certified laboratory um, analyze them for hydrogen sulfide, methane, and VOCs. And we also collect um, perimeter probe samples for VOC analysis at a certified laboratory. So getting into the compliance portion of the presentation, um, the city of Santa Monica um, have, and, and us, the, or the third party environmental consultants, have maintained the landfill gas control system in continuous operation for the past 21 years. Um, during that time, there have been no regulatory enforcement actions issued for the City of Santa Monica landfill by the EQMD or the LEA. Um, there are no landfill gas emissions at the ground surface that have exceeded the regulatory permit conditions, and only the perimeter landfill gas detection probes have had sporadic blips that exceed the 5% methane. Um, when this occurs, um, we follow the permit requirements, um, the AQMD permit that says we go out, we do additional monitoring, and we take corrective actions to try and reduce the methane in those perimeter probes. <clears throat> so this is just a little bit of the compliance history. Um, we started to do graphs for you, but they were very confusing and hard to read. So I thought it would be easier with this visual map um, to see uh, basically, the green dots are the perimeter monitoring probes that have had no exceedances of 5% methane for the last five years. Um, these are the shallow probes. Um, you can see there are a couple probes that have yellow dots, and those are probes that have had um, usually one or two, um, I think in the case of one of them, maybe three or four exceedances of the 5%. Um, but this is over the past five years, and again, these are being monitored four times per year, so that's a total of 20 um, sampling events or monitoring events. <clears throat> um, these are the same map, except it's showing you the intermediate level. So sometimes it's interesting, we'll have, a, we'll have an exceedance maybe in the shallow level, but not in the deeper level. Um, again, we control this by making adjustments to the landfill gas collection system. And then lastly, these are the deep probes here. And again, you can see the yellow ones are, are areas where we had more than 5% methane during one monitoring event. <clears throat> so current maintenance and future upgrades. So since 2016, the city and Montrose have replaced the compressor, upgraded the sumps, replaced some of the landfill gas wellheads, um, replaced sensors at the control system, and provided other ongoing maintenance and repairs. Um, there are some upcoming planned repairs, including improvements to the entrainment or knockout tank, which handles condensate, and also the condensate collection system. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, one of the other current um, projects coming up due to recent, uh, recently detected elevated landfill gas in, found in the vaults located in the city yard. Um, there's two landscape planter areas with vaults. Um, as you know, the, the city yard has been under, undergoing a lot of construction in recent years. Um, and sometimes that construction can uh, change conditions at the landfill. Um, doesn't necessarily mean it's causing the problem or causing increased um, methane emissions, um, but it is a, a landfill is a living, breathing organism. So sometimes if you have some changes at the surface, that can contribute to changes in methane subsurface. So, <clears throat> so we've been doing additional monitoring in these areas um, to make sure that we're controlling that gas. And uh, as part of this, um, we are recommending that we um, that installation of another landfill gas well. Um, so you can see on this figure um, the location of those two vaults that had the elevated readings, and then the location of the proposed new landfill gas well. <coughs> and that we're hoping will be installed. Um, obviously, we have to go through permitting process and get approval from the LEA, um, but we're hoping to get that installed here, um, possibly the end of the year or the beginning of next year. So um, the city of Santa Monica and my company um, are committed to monitoring and maintaining a well-functioning landfill gas control system to protect public safety and the environment. Um, and just to add to that, the reason I got into environmental consulting is because I am pro-environment and I want to do the best I can to ensure that the public health and safety is um, you know, protected <laughs> So, from systems such as this. Because I know it's a little bit frightening for people um, who don't understand exactly what's going on with uh, something that they live next to. So, And that's it. This concludes the presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. Hopefully you didn't all nod off. Maybe you learned something. <laughs> and I'm going to hand it back to the city um, for questions. So uh, do, do we have any speakers? We have one caller. Um, so do, do we want to hear our caller before we ask questions? Sorry, we have two now. Okay. So should we hear our callers before we ask? I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> but uh, it sometimes informs our questions to hear the caller. Okay. So. Okay, Esther, we're ready for the callers. Welcome, Denise Barton. You're in the meeting and your time starts now. Good evening. On the issue of gases released from the landfill under Mountain View, Ms. Barton, we need you to speak. Uh, I, I hate to have to, but we do want to hear you. Good evening. On the issue of gases released from the landfill under Mountain View Trailer Park, the spin and lies you and the city staff are trying to put out there that there there have been no problems with the pumps are blatantly untrue. Remember when you threw through the Housing Authority held me hostage at Mountain View Trailer Park? In a unit that had no telephone or internet line going from the street to the to the unit from mid to the end of 2016, well, during that time, the soil began to rise to what seemed to be a significant level, and someone I knew checked the pumps, and not all of them were working. I contacted the city about it a couple of times with no response. I asked Susan Klein about it at a P&A meeting soon after she retur returned, and she knew nothing about it. I called the EPA, and within two days, it was corrected. So for you to say that you've never had a problems with the pumps is blatantly untrue. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barton. Welcome, Maria Loya. You're in the meeting and your time starts now. Good evening, uh, council members. Um, my name is Maria Loya and I'm here representing the Pico Neighborhood Association. First of all, I want to thank you for um, agendizing this item. It's, uh, it's long overdue, uh, and again, we thank you for bringing this up. This is something that's very important to us. Uh, Gandara Park is a very popular park with young families. As um, the presenter stated, there's always families at the park. In fact, I take my kids uh, to that park, and so Find, um, having this hearing is very important, and there's several questions that that we have. Um, one, in in terms of uh, transparency, is very important, and um, I've reviewed some of the readings in the past, and one of the things that we have found is that 
whenever it rains, uh, there seems to be a uh, uh, higher elevation of methane gases that are being emitted. Um, I, I'd like to know why that is the case, and if there is more methane being emitted, can we put some, is there necessary to put some signs out there to inform people that probably this is not the time to be at that park? Um, so that's, that's one. I think uh, it's also important, we'd like to know what other kinds of gases are being emitted uh, along with methane. Um, that's important. We'd also like to see um, some sort of sign uh, letting people know, letting families know that that's a, a former landfill, and maybe um, having uh, the website on when where people can find some of these readings. You know, um, we'd like to have more quarterly uh, reports coming before the city council, um, just to m monitor how uh, the safety of the park. We think that that's the most important thing is making sure that the park is safe. Um, and so thank you very much. Your time for is your up. Time. Thank you, Ms. Loya. Um, and, and now we move to council questions. So who would like to begin? Council member Villator. Uh, <clears throat> so thank you all very much uh, for the presentation and, uh, um, there's no other park for, that I know in the city of Santa Monica that has this problem with uh, that's that's uh, sits on on top of a former landfill. Correct. This is the only park in the city of Santa Monica. Yes, that is correct. Okay, great. Um, and um, are, are there any other landfills though in the city of Santa Monica, or is this the only landfill that we know in the entire city? This is the, the inactive landfill that was used for municipal solid waste in the former clay mine site. Um, back in the era, there are some maps that have been circulating around where you can see other areas. Um, those it really come to, with solid waste practices historically, and that could be someone's backyard pit. It could be other w waste disposal practices in that time. But in terms of a municipal scale Landfill. This is the the primary area that we're dealing with. Great. And in terms of the research, and I don't know if because the the landfills uh, that we saw the images, uh, very large landfills. You know, and um, I think I've driven by Montebello, the Montebello shopping mall. I remember there's a huge landfill off of I forgot what freeway that is. Sixty. I think the sixty. Um, and, and and you're right that it's adjacent to some uh, residential, but but I think you know the concern for me here is that. There's a park, um, you know, where where children uh, frequent, you know, many times. I mean, there's there's even like a childcare center that is right down the street, and I see that you know small children are are playing. There's a playground there, swings, basketball courts, and so forth. So, um, you know, the, the, there's more heightened awareness around, um, you know, the issue of methane and whatever other and any other toxic chemicals that might be uh, emitting out of the uh, this former landfill. Um, do we, I know the, most of the talk today was methane, but should we be concerned of any other type of toxic chemical that be uh, might be emanating from the this landfill or this former landfill? Why don't I answer a couple of your earlier statements and then I'll let Margaret answer as well. Okay. Um, so I did, I did want to um, remind everyone that the primary, the potent, most significant impact from methane is as a greenhouse gas, mm -hmm. not as a human health carcinogen. So um, whether you live adjacent to the park or you are a regular park visitor, or like I am if your child plays baseball there consistently and for hours after practice ends, um, the primary, the primary, um, the primary issue with the methane is the greenhouse gas. It's it's not a contaminant at that local air quality level. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece that I thought was important um, is uh, really thinking through the use of the park. And it, it is a standard best practice for, yes, this is the only park we have that is sited on top of a landfill, but it's because it's the landfill that we have. Um, but utilizing these sites for parks and golf courses 
is the standard best practice. And we did pull up a couple of um, slides that show you other parks that are on top of landfills, if it would help you to see them, um, as well as some additional educational signage. Um, less on the um, fear-inducing side and more on the where am I? Let's tell the story of where we are. Um, we, we have employed that um, type of educational signage in other parks around the city. So you'll see at Marine Park, we have that around some of our water treatment infrastructure, as well as at Virginia Avenue Park, we have educational signage that tells the story of the site, as well as some of our um, water capture and cisterns. So I, I think there is an opportunity to, to tell that story in a way that um, makes the information accessible, but does not, um, you know, cause concern where it doesn't need to be relative. I to think the that's great. I think the Pico Neighborhood Association, the representative that spoke, uh, suggested some type, some type of signage. Just so that, I think the, the big question here, the big issue here is transparency. Agreed. Because there's, uh, I mean, look, to not sugarcoat at all, I mean, this is the Pico Neighborhood where we put, well, we now, I guess, the city of Santa Monica placed a lot of undesirable development in that part of the city. Um, because of the race of the people that live there. I mean, let's just be straight up. And the income as well. So, you know, low-income people of all ethnicities and uh, and, and people of color, um, for sure, have been dealing with these issues all over the country. And Santa Monica is not immune from that type of environmental injustice, you know, in that practice. So that's that's why people feel concerned sometimes. Uh, there's been things also that it, it, there's like, I'll give you like one quick story about that part. There was a drinking fountain between uh, the basketball courts, so you know, two two rims, and then in the middle there was a, a drinking fountain there, and they eliminated that drinking fountain. And he, this is a true story. I saw the gentleman that it was a contractor, it wasn't a city a city employee, but just the contractor that the city hired to remove the drinking fountain. While they were removing the drinking fountain, I went up there and jokingly I said, "Hey man, you guys are getting rid of my favorite drinking fountain," and he said he looked at me. He goes, "You used to drink this," and I said. Yeah, is there a problem? He said, I wouldn't drink it if I were you. Now, you know, that's, you know, that's just my anecdotal sort of information, but I, I, it did raise concerns on number one, why were we getting rid of the drinking fountain? And then was there a potential for some type of, you know, contamination of the water? You know, like, like, do we know of methane sort of leaking into pipes of water and that contaminating the water? Is that something that's a possibility or not at all? I'm going to let Margaret answer that, but I'm just going to say that I think that, that we all can acknowledge, and it's an appropriate element of this discussion, that structural racism and systems of, of inequality are present throughout our community and throughout communities of color and low-income communities, not only in Southern California, but across the state and the nation. And the reason that we are here sharing this information with you is very specifically to increase transparency around this issue because the landfill gas control system is designed to keep the residents and visitors in proximity to this park safe. So I really appreciate the opportunity to, to just make that connection really clear because that is why we're here. Um, all of us are dealing with the decisions that were made by previous, you know, con you know, previous decisions, right? Whether it's where the landfill is, where it's been, where, you know, what materials are in it. Um, but what we can do is manage it to the utmost ability to model best practices and to make sure that we're transparent in the communication about what's happening out there. And so that's one of the reasons that I am really grateful that this um, project has come to my team because, you know, the Office of Sustainability has modeled the sustainable city plan We've brought the procrastinary principle to this council in many ways, and I think this is just another opportunity for us to make sure that you know, environmental protection, economic vitality, and social equity are mutually dependent and that we are expressing those in each of our activities. So while this may seem like a regulatory uh, moment, it's actually a sustainability moment. And so I think we have found a, a, a moment where we, we are able to bring these things to the forefront and you know, protect <coughs> our residents and protect our city staff and the users of the park. Okay, I appreciate, I really appreciate those comments, by the way, okay. really appreciate you saying that. But Absolutely. just on the question of, yeah, is there a possibility that uh, that the water can be contaminated, the water that, that, that people drink at the park? There's still, a, there's still, a, they got rid of one drinking fountain, that was an older one, but they have, a, they have, uh, you know, obviously a bathroom, a drinking fountain there as well. Should there be concern about any cross contamination with the water? So 
I'm got gonna anything I'm gonna... up to answer your question about that. Um, and then also the question about um, water um, and the increased methane. Correct. The rain, when the rain, when the rain comes into the park, what impact would that have on uh, methane levels? Yeah. Um, so basically, um, again, the, the landfill is full of these little organisms and they actually like moisture quite a bit. So yes, there is a possibility when you have a large rain event um, that you will have an increase of landfill gas um, production. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have more emissions because of that. Again, we've got a control system that's running, sucking on all those wells, and hopefully collecting that and bringing it over to the treatment system. But we can monitor on that question, for example, like after the rain that just happened, if we would we, we would be able to see a spike in methane or not? Uh, it will usually typically take time, so okay. it's not going to immediately happen. Um, what I've seen in past at a lot of the sites I monitor, as an example, that one on Catalina, because they don't even have a landfill gas collection system, uh, when it rains out there, what I'll see um, typically is two to three months later, I may see a slight increase in, in again, very low levels of methane gas um, generally. Um, and again, the methane gas is not toxic. So methane getting into your water, um, it's not really going to mix with water very much. Um, I suspect that the reason that the, the drinking fountain may have been removed may be lead pipes because <laughs> older pipes, because <laughs> older, older drinking fountains had lead pipes in them. Um, and one other thing I want to point out that wasn't as part of this presentation is that the site um, was under um, the notice of the, the water board and they also did um, some groundwater monitoring beneath the site and determined that there was no further action required um, and that permit or that um, investigation was closed. Um, so there is no sign of groundwater contamination from the landfill. Um, and typically, you can get groundwater contamination from landfills, but it tends to be more from leaching, you know, liquids coming out the bottom, not from landfill gas. So landfill gas doesn't really mix as much with, with water. Um, it tends to rise. It's going to take the path of least resistance. So um, it can't really pass through water as much. So, <laughs> yeah. So did I answer... All of those? Well, just one okay. thing in terms of the, the new, the, there's new piping. So let's say you're right. It probably the, uh, the lead piping was the reason why they got rid of the older drinking fountain. But the new drinking fountain mm -hmm. that's there now, I'm assuming that's probably going to, uh, it's probably plastic piping, you know, that goes underground. Uh -huh. Should there be any concern that we should monitor that piping over time because of the methane or the other toxic chemicals that exist in that landfill? Um, well, the, your piping should, um, basically not allow any landfill gas to um, permeate, um, but we do monitor the trenches that some of those pipes run in um, to make sure that there's no uh, buildup of landfill gas in the trenches. Um, so that is something that's done. I don't specifically know about that, the new drinking fountain pipe yeah. <laughs> at the facility. Um, but that's something definitely that could be addressed. If yeah, put, on, to put be. it on the, on the menu. Mm -hmm. And just the last question I had was uh, in regards to, um, um, there's a lot of monitoring going on, which I'm, I'm very happy to hear mm -hmm. that. You know, that biweekly you're looking into things, and mm -hmm. yeah. and there have and there has been some instances where the methane levels have reached a, a higher level than five percent, which makes it volatile, right? Five to fifteen percent. Yeah. Uh huh. Just just to explain though, those are in the subsurface. So the actual surface of the park, um, we do um, do surface monitoring with a piece of monitoring equipment, and the limit that we have actually for the surface of the park is 500 parts per million. So um, part of the reason that there isn't signage there is because it's not required. If there, if you know, if we had concentrations that were high enough to be dangerous to people playing there, we would have Prop 65 warning signs mm -hmm. on the park. Um, so the carcinogenic levels of the landfill gas, um, basically, if the methane is less than 500 parts per million, which is 0 0.01 percent, or actually 0.005 percent, um, then the actual volatiles or the, the toxic chemicals in that gas are going to be 0.00005%. So very, very extremely low levels and unlikely to uh, cause a problem. If there kids. was an, an individual that for some reason went around and tried to light up some stuff like a fire to keep warm, I mean, we have, a, you know, a homelessness crisis and there's been incidents of uh, people setting up fires, you know, on the side of the freeway and other parts. And, and I'm, con you know, just one concern, or should we be concerned that somebody can light something up around there and, 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 it, and it can create an explosion? Uh, not, not with the methane levels generally that you have at your site. Yeah, with larger landfills, um, it actually happened at the Brea landfill when we had some um, forest fires go through the area that the, um, 
the above ground uh, methane pipes that collect the landfill gas did um, did catch fire. Um, and uh, but it actually it damaged the system somewhat, but it didn't really spread the fire um, any worse than, you know, the wildfire that was already going through the area. Um, one of the nice things about your site is all those pipes are subsurface. They're not exposed at the surface. Um, the landfill gas wells are under um, manhole covers which are heavy, difficult to remove. So the biggest danger would be, again, if you have somebody really trying to do vandalism at your site and they're gonna try and pull those, those manhole covers off and maybe throw a match in one of those wells, but they gotta take the cover off, they've gotta open the well up. And then as I, I mentioned briefly in the presentation, they could throw a match down in those pipes. Um, basically what will happen is they might get a short burst of fire and it's gonna immediately put itself out, so. Um, it's not going to start, you know, a giant raging forest fire. <laughs> okay, yeah. uh, Council uh, Mayor Pro Tem McCowan. Um, first, I just want to make sure. Um, I know Council Member De La Torre did have a question about: Are there other uh, chemicals being released from the landfill other than methane that should yes. be monitored? Um, or are they being monitored or what's the status of Yeah, they, they are being monitored. Um, so those typically, um, so volatile organic compounds, again, because they're at so, um, so such low concentrations, um, we don't have equipment that we can just go around and immediately detect you know, a, a reading. So we, we collect those bag samples. We collect a, a 10 liter um, sample of air above the park and also from the landfill gas itself. And we send that off to a lab. And there they use um, high tech equipment to give us a readout of what exactly is in that gas. So. And how often mm -hmm. are those readings done? Um, those are typically done quarterly. Quarter. Some of them are quarterly and some of them are annually. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us just off the top of your head what some of the uh, chemicals that are that you guys find in that airbag. Okay, um, uh, some of the uh, VOCs, I believe, um, actually I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, I do know that there is some hydrogen sulfide um, in the landfill gas. And um, the, the amount of VOCs is kind of sporadic. Um, sometimes there's acetone, um, toluene. Um, there's a couple gases that actually you'll, you'll typically find in, in air as well mm -hmm. uh, near freeways. Um, so it, it's, uh, but again, all of those are relatively low levels, so. And none that fall under the category of toxic. Um, well, they, yes, um, like they to, are. to human. At the like, concentrations, yeah. So right, the, the basically the, the dose makes the poison. So at very low concentrations, um, they're not gonna be, um, present a risk to the public. Okay, um, and, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, go for it. Um, I just, uh, and then uh, again, if, you know, or if people are really concerned, we could, you know, you can do a health risk assessment and you have a toxicologist come in and run a whole bunch of uh, statistic statistical calculations to tell you <laughs> exactly what the risk is. Um, but I can tell you based on other similar sites that I've dealt with that we have done the full health risk assessment on. Um, the landfill, because your landfill gas levels are so much lower, your, your associated health risk, the amount of VOCs in that landfill gas are also much lower. So less likely to be an issue at this site. Uh, again, I can't fully say without doing, you know, the full toxolo toxicological assessment. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, on the soil capping, um, three to five feet was the um, standard then. At that time. At that mm -hmm. time. I'm mm -hmm. curious, has that standard changed to today? Um, actually, it's still generally three to five feet. Um, what's changed is what the type of cap that you know. it is. So um, nowadays there's standards on the, um, it has to be a certain permeability of clay. You have to run some you know, geotechnical testing on it. And then a lot of the modern landfills, they're using um, a geosynthetic liner, is it geosynthetic? can you say it, liner over the top of the sites also to help um, cap. Um, one thing that is good is, you know, anywhere that you have pavement too, that does also act as a cap, so paved areas. Um, and that's generally why we do the surface sweeps more in the unpaved areas because the paved areas act, uh, you know, act as a natural cap. And the DG mm -hmm. areas probably mm -hmm. help yeah. some kind of similar additional component. I don't know, but I would think. Um, Okay, so, well, a couple things. One, thank you, uh, staff, so much for the the great work on this. I, and um, we've we get a ton of questions about this. As someone, you know, and I have a question. <laughs> she knew I was ready. It's to coming. <laughs> so, but 
you know, I, so I know council member De La Torre, council member Parr and myself probably more so than other members of the council get inquiries about this. It's the neighborhood I grew up, grew up in. My father grew up down the street from this, uh, you know, at the time where they were incinerating the trash and when it wasn't a landfill. So, um, you know, we, we uh, don't care more than others, but I think when you are taking your kids there every day during a pandemic, because there's nowhere else they can go, um, you get concerned. And when people are walking around the neighborhood saying that it's toxic, as a member of council, that's concerning. And so to what extent do you think that uh, signage um, to make people more aware, and I, I love the idea of the history of it just to be fully transparent because it wouldn't change someone like myself taking my kids there. I don't actually believe this is toxic, any more toxic than the fact that I live next to a freeway either. But um, I am curious what, options we have for that and what the impact you've seen at other areas of the city where we do sort of add that component. And then um, lastly, the um, I think it's really fitting that we're taking this up on the same night that we're doing SB 1383, <laughs> uh, because that's the real issue here. And um, uh, aside from the fire potential, you guys addressed this, but do is there any feeling that there um, are health concerns at that part? Because I really want to alleviate that uh, concern that's kind of going around. Um, uh, so. Yeah, I, I don't think it's uh, one of the things that the city asked me is, would you live next to it? And I can honestly tell you that I would not have a problem living next to that park. Um, based on the, the data that I've seen from that park. Okay. Um, and that's partly why I think, you know, again, you know, a background sign is, is a good idea, but you don't want to scare people away. It's a, it's a beautiful resource and the health benefits of getting out in a park and, and running around and playing a game and, and you know, far outweigh <laughs> any potential risks, um, which I think are very, very low at this site. Yeah, and I, I think mm -hmm. there's a way to, to talk about the history of that site without scaring people away. I mean, people are still going to scar Starbucks and they have Prop 65 yeah, houses exactly. all over the place. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I'll defer to the, the city lines the, around the, the corner. <laughs> yeah, I've actually really been excited about the possibility of how we might want to tell the story about this of this site, both from the historical perspective, but also to talk about the landfill and to talk about the methane um, and the more importantly, the methane monitoring and control system. Um, particularly because it does really offer us the opportunity to make sustainability infrastructure more visible, right? And so we see this with our Smurf, we see this with some of our investments at Virginia Avenue Park and in other places um, where when we make these choices visible, we are not only you know, minimizing people's concern, but we're also giving them information about the proactive things that are happening around them. Um, I do have, I think, a, an example in here of, um, what am I standing on? Yeah. So here's an, an, an um, example that, uh, that Peter James found um, just you know, from a landfill in the... So th this is obviously not the brand and aesthetic that the city would go for. Debbie would want me to say that very clearly <laughs> and immediately. So I'm doing that in respect for my colleague. Um, but it is starting to, to give you an idea of how other cities are telling the story. And I would really uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to do that at this site. Um, I feel like something like a Prop 65 warning would um, have the unintended consequence of drawing people away from the, the site. And the purpose of having this landfill gas monitoring and control system is so that people feel comfortable and safe and welcomed to one of our you know, important and highly utilized public spaces. So um, this, is, this would be the direction that, that we would recommend that we go. Well, thank uh, you. Guys. Thank you, and, and let me just say, okay, so council, uh, for, I'm just gonna say what order, okay? So everybody, because I know everybody has questions. Council member Negrete, council member Para, council member Brock, and then council member Davis, if you have anything, and then me. So, but there you go. 
You're on. Okay. I'm just going to start with that since you're talking about signage. I, I think education is the best thing because greenhouse gases versus, versus toxicity. Um, it's a great opportunity to educate people and I think it could be used to educate the kids and then they can tell, um, they can educate their peers and whatnot. So I really hope that's something that's in the works and we can do that soon. I did want to ask you though, I think one of the things people worry about when it comes to landfills, and I, I might not be saying it correctly, um, but toxic benzene levels, is that something that we get, or we're concerned about? Are those tested? Yes. And obviously there's no concern because you would have said earlier. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, sporadic um, benzene has been detected um, in the landfill gas. Um, that is um, something that is typically found in, in landfills. Um, at your particular, at the Santa Monica site, it is very low, um, and it's not always detected, so it kind of comes and goes. At what level is it a concern? Because that's really um, the only... It is in parts per billion, um, so very, very low levels. That it's a concern, or you're saying ours are very, very low levels? Yours are very, very low levels, yes. And then when you're taking it quarterly and annually, do you switch up the times of year that you're taking it because as we know rain and other things can change right mm -hmm. what year? yes um, well typically the annual samples are collected in um, December um, which you know actually is the beginning of our rainy season or November or December is uh, you know rainy season um, and then uh, but you know I think we do occasionally have samples um, other than December that we collect so I was just um, reading on my own before this that just to educate myself, because uh, to be honest with you, I think I was misinformed about what it is, right? So then you, I started reading into it and, and got into a wormhole a little bit, but, um, I was just curious because I heard that, um, at other landfill sites over, you know, in the past 20, 30 years that they found that testing during different times of the year makes a difference and it's important. I was just curious if there's a system to that and we do. Yeah, t typically the um, the actual regulatory permits will specify when they want us to do the testing, and so usually we follow that schedule. Um, but um, that's definitely you know something we could talk to the LEA about and see you know if we collect samples at different times per year, um, see if that makes a difference. And then on that education mm -hmm. standpoint, is there something you could put in comparison um, for those of us who don't know a lot about it to say like, well, here's this park, and this is why we feel it's safe for anybody to be on, and in comparison, what wouldn't be safe or is less safe that we tend to ignore? I mean, like Councilmember McCann said, living next to a freeway, I mean, what would be considered more harmful to humans that you can think of that would be a comparison? I think something visual like that, you know, that we could relate to makes it a little bit easier to digest. Well, uh, the freeway is a, a perfect example. Um, but another thing, too, um, a lot of people don't realize is uh, you do have <laughs> Uh, again, the dose makes the poison. Um, so using some of the certain household chemicals that we use in our homes, if we use mm -hmm. them on a regular basis, um, this is something that's come to light in recent years with maintenance um, workers that do a lot of cleaning, um, is that we're breathing in high concentrations of some of those chemicals, especially lately with the pandemic, we're spraying Lysol everywhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> that over time is not very good for us either, and actually may be worse for us because, again, we're ingesting a very... Uh, a large volume of it. Um, so the the small emissions at the park that you that you'll breathe in over the course of an hour playing um, are going to be very very insignificant compared to again, uh, especially spending a lot of time next to a freeway. Of course, in future we may all have electric cars, and then those freeways will not be the the problem that they are now. But in the meantime, we have yeah. Another great opportunity and, to educate our community and use some examples like that maybe so that. Everybody can understand exactly how harmful something is and isn't and the difference between greenhouse gases and how we as a community can actually do better in terms of that impact that we're having on the earth. So thank you for the report and the education tonight. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, one other thing I can point out too on as far as benzene, mm -hmm. um, uh, the reason we have, uh, you know, when you go to fill your car up now, they've got all those little special rubber deal discs on the, that pump yes, is pump. also um, to prevent you being exposed to benzene because right. the, the number one or a larger source of benzene is gasoline. So, yeah. So, so in yeah. essence, dropping some gasoline on your shoe and getting into the car is more yeah, harmful. Yeah, it's probably not <laughs> so good. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I've had an opportunity to, to speak to Rick and Susan a few times, but um, a couple things that came up today and also when I was reviewing um, the documents before this meeting were 
Um, some of the reporting in the, the last five years, some of the probes along the perimeter or the side between Gandhara Park and the Mountain View Park, um, that showed some of the shallow, intermediate, and some of the deep probes. That there were a few times in the last five years that, you know, the levels were over the 5%. Um, and so that was a little concerning to me because, you know, it's my understanding based upon the report that um, all the probes that are in the Mountain View Park um, are no longer being tested because in the past um, the le there, was the there was no readings. Um, there was zero levels or no readings. And so therefore have been uh, discontinued, I think, for the last five years, if I'm not mistaken. So those bl blips along that perimeter tells me that there may possibly still be potentially some readings in Mountain View. And then something that you said um, earlier, that some landfills can keep emitting gas for a long time. So how do we know whether or not there still could be um, some readings significant or otherwise happening in Mountain View and we're no longer testing that? So we don't know, do we? <laughs> So um, I think I had a slide back here that kind of showed that. So yes, we have had some sporadic um, detections on some of these perimeter probes. And here you go is um, right. PP14, 12, and 15, mm -hmm. and then also 6. Um, these uh, detections uh, basically would occur um, during one monitoring event, and then the next monitoring event we would go there, and we would um, not be reading concentrations at that level. Um, there is a couple things um, to, to think about when we're doing the monitoring on these. Um, one of the things that's unusual about your site, normally perimeter detection probes are not right next to the, the waste prism or right next to the landfill. But obviously we, here we have a situation where we have homes very close to um, the former landfill waste prism. And so we've kind of tucked these probes in here and you can see they're very close to some of our landfill gas extraction wells. So those landfill gas extraction wells are sucking gas from all around them um, towards themselves. So having these probes very close to them makes it uh, makes the potential for us to occasionally, when we're doing a reading, um, particularly um, because again, when we're we're sucking, the probes are basically a passive system. So when we're attaching a piece of equipment and sucking on that probe, we're actually acting as a, a landfill gas extraction system, and we may be drawing gas towards that probe. Um, one thing that I've noticed is, you know, sometimes the LEA goes out and reads some probes, and then we go out and read some probes. Um, <clears throat> whether or not we may actually be drawing gas to those probes as part of the monitoring, um, that is a potential. Um, generally, though, what we've seen is that we'll get a detection, and then the, the next quarter there won't be a detection. Again, when we do get detections, we do surface sweeps around the area. Um, we also increase um, the vacuum on the landfill gas system if we can. Um, so we do adjustments to the system to try and control that if we see an increase. Um, and some of those increases, as was pointed out, may be due to liquids. Um, I know that some of the detections in probe PP6 over here mm -hmm. that's in yellow um, <clears throat> were due to a water line break or, or some water in the area mm -hmm. that then um, temporarily increased landfill gas in that area. And I think that one's been clean or clear since 2018. So, <clears throat> so yeah. So basically, it's an ongoing system, which is why we've got to keep monitoring it. <laughs> but do you? So and, then, mm -hmm. but do you? So you don't go into Mountain View? Uh, at no. All? Uh huh. No. Currently, none of the um, the permits for the site require monitoring of those probes. Um, when we took over the system, or when my company took over the system, they were not um, being monitored. Mm -hmm. um, so and. I will defer to the city on the on the history of those probes. Mm -hmm. I don't really have a lot of information on them. Okay, that's a little bit of concern to me, um, just because you know, based upon the conversations tonight, you said that they can keep emitting gas for long periods of time, mm -hmm. and I know that at Mountain View, there used to be gas detections there, and then within the last few years, um, apparently when there was probes being done, there was no longer emissions being noted, and that's why 
there was no longer a requirement for regulatory um, um, having to need monitoring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then it was taken out of the, you know, but I, I still think that we need to, well, I'm of the opinion that we used to, we need to test it. Um, okay. I'll leave it there. I think we need to talk about this a little bit more. Um, another question that I had was when one of the maps that or one of the photos that we looked at showed a shooting range on this site. And so that leads to lead. Um, was there any abatement done on that property for lead? Do we know if we have lead as well? Good evening, Council. Chris Deschopa, uh, your Capital Program Manager from Public Works. Um, so I, I can't say for, for certain, but what I recall uh, in as part of the City Yards uh, Master Plan EIR, uh, we did investigate that. We did a number of borings uh, in that area, and uh, we did not find uh, okay. any. Okay. So, um, I, again, it's... A, a little bit shoot, shooting in the dark. We, we know the area, but we were just mm -hmm. taking r random samples to see. Uh, not that any, um, yeah, none of the work or the abatement or, or the work you now was, was in that area, mm -hmm. but as part of the, the EIR and the planning process for um, the entire site, uh, that was something that we looked into. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me just check out, see. Um, one of, and so going back to, um, I think it was in the staff report, um, it indicated that you were going to put, looking to put some new equipment, I believe, behind the uh, baseball field. Is that, um, and in the photo, Mike. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, um, and in the, it was kind of hard for me to tell. So in the photo, it appeared to be behind the baseball diamond. And I was just curious if that equipment was going to be above ground or underground or Pull that photo. like how intrusive that equipment was going to be. Uh, no, it will be, it'll be subsurface. It's actually in the, um, the city yard there. Um, so yeah. this is a, unfortunately we couldn't get a newer aerial photo, but, um, you can see, uh, this is your, you've got a new building here, um, that these vaults, um, the one vault is near. Um, and so yeah, this landfill gas well is going to be over in the city yard. Um, not, not near the, the baseball diamond. Oh. Why yeah. my picture looked like it was like right there. Oh, okay. <laughs> and and the other good thing about putting a well in this area is again it will um you know control landfill gas. So basically it's going to start pulling landfill gas towards it um and away from the baseball field. You know ideally. Council member, I'm looking at you're looking at Figure Six. Uh huh. And it looks like when it was inserted, it just leaked it the, where the white box is. Right. It looked like it was right on top of it. Okay. So it's not. <laughs> Okay, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, because I'm like, that looks very different than what I was looking at. <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay, thank you, Shannon. <laughs> Yeah, and, and before this well will be put in, um, we will again have concurrence from the LEA and the regulators huh. um, on the location as okay. well. So it may potentially move slightly, but um, this is the general area that we are recommending okay. that it's installed. Awesome. And I think that's it for now. And I'll leave my comments for later to discuss the other part about the Council Mountain View. Hi, I have a, a few questions. So. Um, and some of the other council members have already touched on some of these issues. But as we went from uh, Brickyard and China ceramic making uh, pit to uh, Silva Field, which was the original name of the baseball field in the park there, and the gun range was uh, along the southeast corner, of that, I have anecdotal evidence over the last 25 years that people occasionally have found shells 
in that area. Not not loaded, but old shells. So I have I want to reinforce the the question about lead in the soil, especially along the area where the gun range may have been. I think that still concerns me. Um, are there any other, I know we talked about methane and some other chemicals, but the ground continues to shift there. It's no longer usable as a baseball field. It's really more of a, a small moguls for cross-country skiing if the climate really changes. So my question is, have we looked at the ground? That, that, now I understand this is the second covering of the ground since the, the uh, trash heap was there. I understand it, it stayed level for the first 15, 20 years. The city, now I may be wrong, but the city, I understand, excavated it and resurfaced uh, the ground cover. So have we looked specifically at the ground? Has it continues to alarm me and others in the area that we see the shifting of that ground constantly? So I can remember when that was really a great little league field. It's not now. So have we looked at that ground cover? And then, and then I have a couple of questions about that that are follow-ups. Yeah, well, I, I can't specifically address the, the, the ground cover or the construction that's been done at the, the park, um, but I can tell you it is very typical for landfills to have settlement. Um, that is part of the reason they are used for golf courses and parks is we don't want to put structures right on top of them because of settlement. Because basically, um, as those bugs are eating away at the trash, it's compressing, um, and so it's going to start sinking. So areas where you have a lot of settlement indicates that a lot of that material um, has been consumed, basically. Um, one good thing from that is areas where you have a lot of settlement may mean you're reaching the end of landfill gas production in that area. So, um, And I know we've had a lot of settlement next door in the city yards where some of the, the uh, shelter uh, structures have settled and have have changed a lot. So my question, however, is there are new ways of utilizing ground cover now that would that would cover the remaining um, refuse that's down the ground. Would it be prudent to actually look at resurfacing, tearing out the old ground cover, making sure there is no, there are no chemicals, there's nothing in there, there's no lead, no anything else, and resurfacing this over time and looking for grants to be able to do that. Possibly even using it as a catchment basin as we're doing in other areas for gray water. And I think With the proper, you know, uh, sealants and, and things in there, would that make it overall safer and better for use and would restore the ability to have a, a baseball field there or pickleball courts or whatever else we want to do. Yeah, I'll defer to the city on that. Um, I, I would say that um, landfills have had additional cover materials added to them. Um, that is something you can investigate. Um, obviously, it, it really depends on cost and how much you're willing to spend to, to haul in a lot of extra clay or, or put in additional liners on top of this site. Um, but I wouldn't remove the cover that's already existing there. I would just add, if you're going to do something with it, I would add more. You'd add another cover and make it... Mm -hmm. level. Yeah, yeah. Digging things up and exposing things Causes is going to be problems. a worse, yeah. <laughs> so there may be stuff under there that we don't want to see or know about. <laughs> we know well, we just don't want to expose pose yeah. people well, to on. it. Yeah. <laughs> it's my turn. Yeah. Yeah, we just don't want to expose people to it. When we go when we go digging and, and excavating, you know, we're exposing people to, you know, Well, I the, know they the, did the this waste. once. Mm -hmm. At one time, they tore up the ground cover and put new ground cover in. So when I had heard there were better, there were newer, better ways to seal it, mm -hmm. would it be better to find a new way to seal it to make sure that it gave all the residents peace of mind? It was a more usable park. So I, I think you're, there are a couple questions here. I think yeah, that, there's three uh, or four. Yeah. Mixed in. So I, I think um, Margaret's observation is a is important and like the prudent answer, which is um, this landfill is currently contained and we have a 
highly functioning landfill gas monitoring and control system that keeps us, you know, in, in excess of regulatory compliance. And so we would want to be very judicious in any circumstance where we are disrupting that, right? So when I hear you say, should we dig it up? I think this is a biological system where small amounts of water or movement can have, you know, impacts. And so my, my observation there would be, no, that wouldn't be our most prudent, um, movement. Um, but I, so that, I think that's what I, what I heard her say and what I wanted to amplify. Um, the other thing that I heard you say is, you know, are there opportunities with to augment the existing cap in a way that would allow us to utilize the, the baseball field? And so as a baseball parent and as a person who sits on the field space advisory committee with my parent hat on, I know that that would be, you know, bringing this field back into that level would, would be welcome by, by our community. Um, I'm not going to wade into the pickleball part of it because I know that's <laughs> your, your, I had to throw that. To bear. Um, but, but I will, um, I do think that, um, these would be complementary, but not, um, at necessarily connected ways of addressing the, um, the sports field needs at Gundar Park. Can we or should we do boring samples of the ground cover in the park and in, in different areas to make sure there's nothing that we've missed? Other than, I, I understand we are, we are totally covered with methane, but I'm asking about other things that may be in the park. And as much as everyone just said, oh, we don't want to dig it up, that immediately gave me cause for alarm. So is there a way to look at other types of um, getting samples of the earth, et cetera, and analyzing to make sure we're okay in all areas that the public would go to? I, I think that the, the clear answer there is, as Margaret mentioned, um, we, we do test, in addition, methane for volatile organic compounds and, and other components that would be your primary concern. And because we do test those and because we do send them to an independent lab, I think that one of the key messages that I want you to hear and that I want the members of the public to hear is that they are safe when they use this park. Um, and and that's, that's important. Um, are there opportunities as we look down the line to um, identify other areas of concern. Potentially, we would need to look at, you know, get in con connect with our colleagues at city yards and in parks and see what information and what uh, research and what testing was already done for environmental impact reports on previous projects. The, the data that you're looking for, which is beyond the scope of what we're talking about right now, it may exist. It may not just have been packaged in the way that, that you're looking for right now. So I think that that would be the, the appropriate next step. It wouldn't be um, necessarily to go there immediately, but to look at what information we already have. As far as the residents who live next door, I think Council Member Parra just touched on something that concerns me as well. And I've had instances in the park back in 2013, 2014, where residents of Mountain View came to me and said, we've had leaks from the city yards for five or six months now, and it's sort of a green algae, weird water. We've asked several times, nobody's done anything. Will you come over and look at it? And I was, uh, it was during one of the jazz concerts and I walked over and looked at it, took pictures. And within a week, uh, the city had said, oh, we fixed the leak. We've taken care of it. But it alarmed those residents to have a leak going past their front doors. So I, I question the fact that we're not monitoring there because that's where people are living. And even though it's not a requirement, I would think, and I see Rick getting up to answer that, but I would think that just for peace of mind for the residents of Mountain View, that they would want to feel that the same monitoring that's going on in the park is going on there if that was part of the landfill or directly adjacent. And, and maybe I'm wrong, but that's what my question is. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, Rick Valtier, Acting Director of Public Works. Um, so as has been stated before, those uh, probes within the Mountain View Mobile Home Park had been tested for, I think, up to a 
decade before and consistently presented a non-detect or zero uh, reading on methane. And it came to a point where the regulators no longer required it. And as uh, Mar Margaret uh, mentioned, it's, it's no longer part of our permit. So certainly I understand that there might be a concern um, of continuing you know, uh, for residents to think that there might still be that what if uh, gas continues to um, emit in that area. Um, the data doesn't show, show it. Um, Certainly, the council can direct us to do, continue the, the, the monitoring in that area. It's just that, is that where we want to spend our limited resources? Do we want to continue monitoring uh, methane gas in an area that has shown non-detect for an extended period of time and it's no longer required by the regulators? But, and, and maybe I missed that, but I understand that methane levels ebb and flow as the ground settles and has different things happen in the area. So I, w I, I think making sure that we have health risk assessments in that area would be crucial, regardless of whether it's restoring all the methane measurements, but making sure that that area periodically is checked so that the residents of Mountain View can feel that their health is never at risk. If it Other would. than from the household uh, spray they may have been using during the uh, pandemic. So we can certainly look into um, perhaps spot checks of the probes that exist within the Mountain View Home, uh, Mountain View Mobile Home Park. Um, we could potentially go out there, uh, locate the probes and take spot check readings just to reconfirm that uh, we still continue to have zero uh, readings of methane in the area. And at the same time, do some sort, I'm gonna, I know I'm repeating myself on this one point, but looking at the ground throughout uh, Gandhara Park, just to make sure that, you know, I know at one time there was a gun range, there have been other things there to make sure that the ground is safe. And I'm not talking about methane, but from whatever else could be there. Again, I think it's peace of mind for residents. And um, I know our CEO of Public Works uh, a few minutes ago mentioned, or there was a slide put up about showing the history of the area. I think that should be done uh, absolutely. Not in, a, not in a scary way, but to say, here's the history of what was here. Uh, I just pulled up a picture of my mother's china, which was made from clay at that pit and she has it at home. So I'm entertaining bids right now. No, I'm not. <laughs> um, but but uh, the point is, I think it would be good regardless to give the history of what was there from Silva Field to the brickyard for the city, you know, to all these different things that went on there. I think that should be done in all of our parks regardless. So where's the question? And I'll rest. The question? I, I just said I'll rest. Is that your comment too? No, it was a question. Shouldn't it be done? And I like the fact that uh, it had been brought up and I've seen that in okay, other okay, parts throughout okay. the nation. It, that, and that wasn't a question either, but I do have a question. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize you were going. Well, no, uh, you can go first. No, no, I, I, no, go, go, go. So hopefully this can be brief, but I really think we need to answer this question, yes or no. Is Gondara Park safe for people to use? Yes. And is Mountain View Mobile Home Park safe for people to live there? Yes. Thank you. Now, we keep talking about the fear of methane, but I want to go back. If you are in Gondara Park and if there is some escape of methane, it is not toxic to breathe in the methane. Is that correct? So it they're, they're nodding yes. So <laughs> Yes. <laughs> So, so even if there were occasionally due to rain or whatever elevated methane levels, that doesn't present a uh, health risk to people in the park or in the mobile home park. It just presents a greater risk to the environment because it's a greenhouse gas and will cause global warming. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Um, in terms of flammability, because I know that's been a concern from people using the park. One of the things that people have asked is, well, why does it say no open fires? in Gandhara Park. 
Isn't it true that we don't allow open fires in any of our parks, whether or not they're on landfills? I believe that's the case. Okay. And in terms of the increased uh, levels of methane that we might say, because we did see on some of those probes, I understood that that was not sufficient to cause fires that would, you know, pro pro pose a threat to either people in the park or in the mobile home park. Is that correct? So as Margaret explained, um, methane has a very limited range at which it is considered flammable. It's either above 5% and below 15%. Anything below 5 or above 15, you either have too much concentration of methane or not enough concentration of methane. And on top of that, it has to be mixed with oxygen for a fire to be, to be sustained. And have we had any instances of fires in Gontara Park due to methane emissions? Uh, I'm not aware unless my staff no. Okay. And as far as we know, have we had any incidents of fire in Mountain View Mobile Home Park due to the presence of methane gas? I'm I mean, not aware of any fire caused by methane. Okay. Now, there was some talk about ground contamination. And I do want to point out that park is used by people throughout the community. I understand it's a focus for people in the Pico neighborhood. But my son played youth soccer there, and we do the Americana, we did the Americana series recently, we did jazz in the park there. So it's widely used by people throughout the community. So I think it's important to focus on whether or not that park is safe to use. Do we have any reason to believe that the ground in, well, let me back up one, the shooting range. When I look at that, it looks like the shooting range was where the city yards are, not where Gondara Park is, is that correct? I mean, as far as we can tell, do we have the... Uh... Because you had it on the map there. It doesn't look like it's where the park was, but I could have been wrong. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Did you remember all these slides? Is there going to be a test? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm close. Almost there. I think you can there. see it better there. No, there it is right there. Because you can see the baseball diamond, where is the, sh but the shooting range looks to me like it's in the, where the city yards are, but I could be wrong about that. Yeah, based on what I'm just looking at, just eyeballing it, 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 it looks like you're right that it is uh, within the city yards. So if we're concerned about lead, for example, from the use of bullets, that would be, I'm not saying we shouldn't test for it, but that would be in the city yards project as opposed to in Gondara Park, and we obviously had to do an EIR for the City Yards Project, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, do we have any reason to believe that the ground in Gondara Park is contaminated with any hazardous material? I mean, other than the fact that part of it is uh, the landfill. Um... Yeah, other than the fact that it's covered with a landfill and it's been capped. Um, I can't see why we would consider it toxic or subject to any type of soil remediation. Right. Well, I mean, for example, Mountain Gate Country Club is built on a landfill. People pay tens of thousands of dollars a year to go golf on top of a landfill. Is that correct? I mean... Not a member, but um, I <laughs> believe it is. <laughs> and, and there are actually homes right next to the... And they are million-dollar homes next to that former landfill, right? Yes. So, I mean, at least our experience as a region has been that land, the, the mere existence of a landfill doesn't necessarily pose a threat <laughs> to people using where the landfill was or living next to the landfill. As long as they're properly monitored with the landfill gas monitoring system the way... <laughs> Our landfill is okay well that was going to be my next question and based on our monitoring and all the work we've done and it's certainly been you know quite a bit of work do we have any reason to believe that there's any danger posed to anybody using gundara park or living at mountain view mobile home park not at this point okay great thanks rick while you're here um i, I do have a question and it relates to a um a uh, letter we got from Pico Neighborhood Association. Have you seen that letter? Yes, I have. Oh, good. So uh, I'm looking at a chart that's on page 14 of 15 of that letter, which you may have seen that shows a series of very high concentrations. Thank you, Peter James. <laughs> <laughs> 
and the chart mysteriously appears, right? Um, on you, page Steph. 14, there is a, a, a chart that shows high readings of methane at TP2A and TP2A, uh, TP2B over a period of years. Can you tell us what that mean, what those readings mean? So this is a record of one of our trench probes, TP2, um, and we found uh, high readings uh, of methane in this trench probe, and uh, Montrose ex explored it. They took the uh, samples, brought it to a lab, and they found that the readings do not match that of the landfill. And the, the readings were more... Uh, um, match that of sewer gases. And we found that, if I'm not mistaken, that this uh, trench probe is actually clo uh, located close to a sewer line. And the assumption here is that what we're reading there regularly is coming from the sewer line, not from the landfill. And this has been explained in the staff report, and this is explained to the SCA QMD and the um, LA County Department of Public Health that this is an ongoing uh, situation. And it is, um, it, uh, it's on record but it's not um, gas that's coming from the landfill, it's from the sewer line. And it was explained to the PNA when they sent an email about this several months ago. Yes. Just that is for correct. The, for the record, so that's all in. But in we haven't discussed it publicly, and I think it's important to discuss it publicly. Um, so, um, great, now I lost my train of thought. Thanks a lot. Um, so, uh, at one point, there was a lot of interest in this whole area, including when we passed the Bergamot Plan. And, and it's my understanding in looking at historic maps of the entire Bergamot area that there were clay pits not just here, but, uh, but also north of Olympic where uh, uh, we have uh, uh, big buildings built on top of those clay pits, which may have also been used as landfill sites, is that? I see Shannon nodding. So, Shannon, could you address that? Because I remember looking at that at the time. Oh, or, the, yes, the master of the Bergamot plan. There's things that worked out better for that plan. But I think the, the assumption is correct that there was a, I voted against it. <laughs> you were the only one. I was. Um, that there was a tremendous amount of clay mining activity back in the early 1920s. So sites like um, Red Bull, the Dresherville property that's now owned by NMS on Nebraska, they all have a legacy of sort of deep pits. Uh, Dresherville actually has tunnels that run beneath it. Uh, some of those pits are still visible to this day. And I know from having worked with the tenants and the property owners in that area that they have had to... Uh, invest substantially in um, shoring their buildings, driving deep piles through the waste to get to the bedrock. So it's, it's part of their pro formas when they develop on those areas. But this was common sort of on the east end of Santa Monica, um, not just uh, in the Pico area, but extending north. Right. You have to remember the development of the city really originated at the shoreline, and it wasn't until after the Second World War that we saw the expansion of places like Sunset Park and Mid-City. So the area of Bergamot really was the Wild West up until, you know, modern day. And so there were a lot of uh, activities like that occurring in and around that time. And so, correct me if I'm wrong, but there have been numerous EIRs done in this area for projects, et cetera, and numerous soil borings uh, of areas like the one that Gondar Park is today. That's correct. And the city has a lot of those on record. I believe there's also um, uh, hazardous materials reports that come to us through private uh, development. And uh, certainly in this area, we would have a record of those if anybody's interested. In and if there were something, you would be able to address it today. But my recollection is, I mean, that wasn't why I voted against it. But there was nothing, <laughs> right, then. Right. Yeah, right. thank you very much. Those are my questions. Who would like to begin the discussion? No one? <laughs> um, uh, well, let me just say, let, let's start with this. This is a study session. 
So uh, we can ask questions um, and discuss what happened. We uh, can give direction if it's voted on, I guess. But that is all we can do. So um, yes, so Council Member Parr, I'd love if you started. Sure, thank you. I think that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, um, I appreciate this information and just really the education. It's invaluable, um, not only for us, but I think for the residents because there has been so much misinformation and um, and also I think the education is just really important. Um, and I love the idea of having some type of informational signage there so people can make informed decisions about you know, whether they want to be there or not, um, but also to learn right about the history of the park in our neighborhood and instead of all this you know chatter about what's going on there and what's not going on there um, I think that you know our residents in Mountain View um, they've gone through a lot they have gone through a lot and I think it's really important for us to continue to support them and to make them feel safe regardless of what those percentages are or are not. I like what Rick said about potentially doing some spot checking. I'm really interested in learning more about how we can do that and, and, and make that information available to them, um, you know, regularly. And uh, because I know that that would ease my mind if I live there. And I know that there's a lot of, you know, of our older residents that live there who may not have access to computers or Wi-Fi or what have you or have not have, you know, an understanding possibly of the process and technology. And so I think that um, being able to at minimum do some spot testing um, to be able to ease their, their mind, um, I think is the least we can do for our residents in Mountain View. And I would be really happy to see my colleagues um, agree to at minimum something um, of that nature, and um, that's all I have to say. So are you making a motion uh, to give staff direction to implement a spot checking program for Mountain View? I uh, Sure. I'll second. Um, Mayor. Or not. As, as, your, as your admonition uh, that this is a study session, you could give direction to staff to come back with a program for your consideration that would include informational signage, uh, the nature, and spot checking uh, landfill gas admissions at the park. That's two things I've already heard, and you could give direction for them to come back for action at a future meeting. Mayor, if, if I may, I, I was keeping track of sort of the discussion. I think there are four items that I heard that I'd like to kind of follow up with staff on, if I may just interject in terms of some of the discussion. Yes. So. Uh, as our chief special counsel, chief, uh, sorry, I don't have your title exactly right, Alan, uh, uh, mentioned. Joe's assistant. Yes. <laughs> so we received direction about. I just call him the city attorney sitting in the right chair. <laughs> that's, what I was, that's what I was going to do. Uh, so we got direction about developing signage at the park, uh, expressing the history of the park. Uh, there was some discussion that I want to go back to the team on about doing some co sort of health risk assessment um, and looking comprehensively at the park to provide some information and thoughts about and information about the safety of the parks. So I want to go back and talk about what that would look like. As uh, Council Member Parr mentioned, that was doing and it was brought up as well by the entire council was doing some spot checking at Mountain View Park. So I'd like to follow up with our public works director about what that would look like. And then the last one I got that I think, you know, would probably I think we'd be incumbent upon us to at least take a look at and develop, see what the cost proposals could look like. We'd be looking at the park itself. There's discussion about the unevenness of the park and its usability. So I'd at least like to be able to see if we could develop over time some sort of cost estimate of what it'd be like to level out the park itself. Those are the four things I was sort of tracking as follow-up items from this discussion. Um, and I, I see I Council Member Parr nodding. So I think that... Uh, okay. To, to, um, to, to state it correctly, what is on the table is a motion for staff to come back with us with recommendations, suggestions, and ideas about signage, about spot testing, about environmental assessments, and about, um, uh, about how the park could be made more user-friendly on the surface. 
Is that it? Yes. And so, yes. So that's friendly to the mover, that's friendly, friendly to the seconder. Absolutely. But um, uh, does anyone else have anything else they want to raise about this? Council Member uh, De La Torre. Just, just in, I mean, there's a series of reports and, and um, uh, I guess they're state, LEA and SCAG MD, those are state, right, both? Yeah. So so they're providing reports. We're doing biweekly. Um, so, so is there a way to consolidate that information or somehow where, where, where can residents find that or where can the council get that? Or is there is there a web page, uh, some portal that we can – upload that information so people can monitor along with staff those reports? Uh, we did put as attachments to the staff report the um, public records request to both the South Coast Air Quality Management District and the LA County Department of Public Health um, so to receive those reports um, for so anyone who's interested. And then also our public works director has made them available to anyone who has requested them. Okay. I can't call on you. Council Member Brock. To follow up on that, could that annually be put on a website in the city? So if any resident in that area wanted to look, they could look at those reports rather than do a public records request. That's cumbersome. So I'd like to make it as transparent as possible. Um, if annually that could be placed on a city website, I think that would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, so we will uh, then incorporate in the motion and providing information on an annual basis. Annual, yeah. So staff will look at that too and the best way to do that. Okay. Council Member Brock. I, I want to just thank the staff, thank the consultant firm for coming to us and for the conversation that we've had tonight about Gandara Park because I had had questions dating back to 2011 or earlier, 2010, and I remember it being discussed at the Recreation Parks Commission when uh, former Commissioner uh, McKinnon was still on the commission. That's a long time ago. So I'm really grateful that we've had this time for this discussion, and I hope as Council Member Davis uh, made sure the staff reiterated that the park is safe for residents to use. And I thank everyone for that information, and I hope that resonates with the residents that we were concerned and that um, everyone from staff to uh, outside firms are monitoring the safety of that area. So thank you. Any other comments? Yes, we're going to in a minute. I may have something to say. Um, I, I do want to thank you all for this report. And um, as somebody who is from a cam family that was in the chemical manufacturing business, like trichloroethylene, right? I mean, I grew up with this in my house around, uh, I mean, it was everywhere. And I have to say to members of the public that when the family business finally closed and it was directly next to Raven Stadium in Baltimore, there was no remediation. They paved it. They put in some uh, 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 chemical eating bacteria and, and paved it over. I mean, this is... Um, uh, I know what toxics are like, and in fact, I had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that relapsed. Blood cancers seem to run in my family, and I don't believe that that's unconnected. So I really appreciate the attention to this that staff pays. I'm always impressed with it, and I remain impressed with it. I want to thank you very much for this, and I think we've made some steps forward tonight. And on that note, can we take a vote, please? Okay, so we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you guys to go ahead and start the vote. And we have the council member Parr made the motion and council member Brock was the seconder. Yes, that's right, thank you. Council member Parr. Oh wait, my screen, yes. Council member Davis. Yes. Council member Negrete. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McCowan. Yes. Council member Brock. Yes. Council member De La Torre. Yes. And Mary Helmerich. Yes. Although I think that I just turned my yes. Oh, no, that worked. So uh, push your yes. Thank you. Mine was on and then it was off. So seven to zero. There you go. 
Um, and and uh, thank you all for a great report and, and uh, for really answering all of our questions. We really appreciate it. Um, and now we're on, we're moving on from methane to sewer capping. <laughs>